what many people don't think about is that self-promoting has a lot to do with social norms. And I think Latin culture, as you mentioned, are an amazing example of we can be taught to be modest and taught that this actually is good and that we shouldn't brag, right? That bragging is something bad. But if your peers, for example, update their manager in their project and you don't, you very easily fall behind on perceived competence. So this is not about bragging, it's simply stating the fact. As we teach at I'm Remarkable, accomplishments do not speak for themselves. Welcome to Latinx in Power, a podcast hosted by Thaisa Fernandes. Welcome to Latinx in Power, a podcast with the goal of helping to demystify tech. The way we do that is by interviewing Latinx leaders all over the world to hear their perspective and insights. Today, we are talking with Juliana Lisboa. Juliana is the global strategy and operations of a Google project called I Am Remarkable. Ju, which is the way we call her in Brazil, took an unusual path by working in technology across multiple countries and cultures in the Asia Pacific. Welcome, Ju! Hi, Thais. I'm so happy to be with you. Thank you so much. Of course, I'm really excited to be talking with you today. So today we are asking Juliana some questions about this amazing project that she leads. For those who don't know, I Am Remarkable is a Google initiative to empower women and other underrepresented groups to celebrate their achievements in the workplace and beyond. At the end of this episode, we will have a surprise for you, so stay tuned. And Ju, how everything started? Oh, yes, that's a big question. So I was born in a city called Campinas, which is southeast of Brazil. My mom was 15 when she got pregnant with my sister, 17 when I was born, and 18 when she was divorced and broke. Thankfully, typical Latin family, we had a lot of family and friends support. I was raised surrounded by very strong women. I could see my mom, my grandma, even my great grandma really working hard to give us a better opportunity than they have. So I think in a very young age, I already felt empowered to create my own path and encouraged to be always curious. With that in mind, my first scholarship maybe had been when I was nine, my first informal job when I was 11. And by 17, I already moved alone to Sao Paulo, which is uh, a 20 million city, right? To work and study. With 17, Jo? Yeah, 17. Whoa. So I found my way, you know, through to get to a graduation. You know, I ended up graduation actually in a top university. I even had a year abroad in Milan due to another scholarship. So by the age of 24, I had already a very different life. From where I started, I was a manager in a big corporation. I was leading marketing and digital strategy with a sizable team. I was checking all those boxes of success that I created online. And some of those were don't get pregnant, do well in school, get a job, you know, all these things that we tell ourselves that success looked like. But somehow I was not feeling fulfilled. I was actually more insecure as time passed, but I would try to hide that at all costs. And that made me feel even more stressed. After several years of that cycle, although I was getting a great feedback at work and everything looked right from the outside, I simply was not okay. And eventually I got the courage one day and quit my job. It took really a while for me to articulate why I left, you know, such a successful track. But today I can understand that I was powered through so much of imposter syndrome, value clash, sexism. It really became unbearable. Anyways, after that period, I opened up my own business, which was another big learning curve, but gave me much more joy, honestly, than I was having in the corporate world. I was living a more authentic life, a more flexible lifestyle, and start realizing that checking all those boxes didn't mean success. And honestly, I just had to respect my true self and who I really was. When I thought that my career path was set like as an entrepreneur, uh, another big turn happened. A uh, dear friend sent me an opportunity to work at Google and insisted that I apply. Oh, so you decided to apply for this role and kind of stop working in your own business. How was this process for you? Because you are working with something that you truly loved, right? 
So I didn't think that I was getting that job. So I literally did it for the sake of, you know, okay, done. And I never really thought it through. Okay, I will leave my job or anything like that. It was really about, you know, my friends insisted. I said, I'll give it a try. They will not call me and that's done. But they did call me. <laughs> and I ended up starting at Google. And again, I was sure that I was not going to stay for long. So I didn't close my business or anything. I tried to keep both for a long time based off my experience on the past. I didn't think I would ever fit in. But yes, here I am. Uh, seven years later, at the end, I had to close my business. It was impossible to keep both. And during those seven years at Google, I worked in different roles. The past three years, I've been based in Singapore. I was leading product strategy and operations for 15 Asia-Pacific countries. So working with DAC in different cultures and roles made me even more aware and interested about social inclusion. So luckily, this year, I was able to make another move. And since the beginning of the year, I've been leading strategy and operations, but now for I'm Remarkable, this global program that fight those bias that made me quit my first job to start with. So yeah, the word goes around. Yeah, yeah, it's a full circle. And it's so interesting because since a young age, you are always really strategic about your choices, first with the scholarships and then checking the boxes, but also experimenting and then realizing, oh, this doesn't make any sense. I'm doing my own thing and feeling fulfilled, but at the same time, being open to new opportunities. And then Google came to your life. So that is really cool. For me, it felt very organic, but you're right. I think there was a, something about being curious and just give it a try. Even I didn't have the self-confidence, you know, and I thought Google would not call, but yet I tried. And I think that's a good thing, right? It shaped somehow my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. Your friend also pushing you, helping you in this journey. This reminds me of another episode. Leo said that one single act of kindness changed her whole career. And that is so amazing. Absolutely. I completely agree that sometimes we just need a little push. And here we go. Amazing. And what does it mean to be a Latinx for you? This is a very interesting question because, to be very honest, I didn't recognize myself as a Latinx for a long period. Growing up in Brazil, I don't know how you felt, but I felt just a Brazilian. You know, I didn't label myself as a Latinx. And honestly, when I saw all those Spanish-speaking countries, I felt they were so different from, you know, the reality I lived in and their story, their culture. I could not really understand how anyone could actually cluster, you know, as a whole. But after, I think, studying more and working in global companies and living abroad, that perspective changed. I got to learn so much about our shared colonialism and uh, simply experience a weird connection that truly happens when you meet someone from Colombia, Venezuela, or even other Brazilians on that setup. Now I truly consider myself super Latina, like I totally recognize myself in that label. I think also living in Asia can be super challenging, like how different culture is around you. And having Latinx friends around me, they just make me feel home, even so far from home. It can be like just showing up, you know, showing that they care, doing like a small kind act, like you mentioned, or my favorite sharing food. Uh, it's just the small things that make my experience here much more comfortable. So for me today, being a Latinx is having having a part of her identity rooted in Latin America, which has this amazing history of resilience, creativity, and a big sense of community and how that shaped all of our culture. At the same time, there is a part of me that indeed believes that we are, you know, a group of unique, you know, and it's important to recognize, you know, the uniqueness of each country, each culture, or even each individual. So yes, I'm a proud Latina. And also so many other things. We have a huge diversity in our community and we should celebrate it as a way to fight stereotyping. This is exactly why this space that you created is so important. We need to celebrate each other and this is a great opportunity to do it so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I like what you said about celebrating our similarities and at the same time our uniqueness. 
that of course we have a lot in common, but we have a lot of other things. And sometimes it's easy to put people into like boxes, but we are more than one box. You know, we are many, many, many other things. And it's important to acknowledge that and celebrate that too, right? Absolutely. It's so important to hear stories. And that's what I love about this podcast. You know, I think you need to have more Latinx stories being told. So we we can recognize this uniqueness and this diversity and the same thing, those amazing characteristics that make us so much proud of our identity. Can you tell us a little bit more about the I Am Remarkable initiative? Sure. So I'm Remarkable was started in 2016 with two women named Anna that also worked at Google. They participated in a leadership program where women were asked to do a simple exercise of talking about their accomplishments. And so many struggled to do it. With that inside, they looked for literature and it was proven what they intuitively know. Women in other marginalized groups often struggle with lack of confidence, and that had an impact in their perceived confidence, their careers, or even at home. Then they started I'm Remarkable that this at its heart is this 90 minutes workshop that makes people reflect and act on modesty norms and biases. Today, this program counts with over 8,000 trained volunteers delivering workshops across the globe. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm really impressed with this number. It's really an impressive example of the power of community, I think. Together, we delivered workshops for more than 230,000 people across 150 countries. But I personally find the most impressive number is that half of those that answered our survey that they had a job or a career growth in attribute to I'm remarkable. This, I think, really shows and proves the importance of sharing again and recognizing each other and finding this, this sense of worthiness and increasing your confidence. Another interesting fact is that over 800 companies now use I'm Remarkable as a tool to increase diversity inclusion in their organization. So definitely there is a lot of work that needs to be done, but I feel proud to be a key part of this initiative in trying to do a real impact, a positive impact to change corporate world and people's life in general. That's amazing. That's a huge impact. And now we are seeing a lot of people talking a little bit more about imposter syndrome, but they are not talking that much about the confidence and how this affects our, as you said, not just our work, but our relationship with ourselves at home. So this is huge. How long does Google have this initiative? It's been a year already? So I'm Remarkable started in 2016, but really scaled in the last two years. You know that at Google, we have that concept of 20% projects, right? Which is a project that you can dedicate time. So today we have over 100 people at Google that dedicate one day of their week to the program. And that makes a huge difference, right? You can imagine the power of having those brain working uh, to roll out such an important initiative. So this scale that we achieved, it really happened the past few years, but the concept was something that is earlier than that. And what are usually the main barriers when it comes to talking about our own accomplishments? I can imagine how hard it is or challenging it is for folks like us, Latinxes and minority groups. Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. We don't talk about our accomplishments because we fear. We fear being judged and not being enough or simply not fitting. It's that inner voice that holds us back from sharing an idea in a meeting, applying for a job, or even having a tough conversation at home. The issue is that as any other skill, if you don't practice talking about your accomplishments, you'll be more likely to lack confidence when those moments showed up. And the cycle continues. 
So we need to build this muscle of self-promoting and with practice, it becomes much more natural. What many people don't think about is that self-promoting has a lot to do with social norms. And I think Latin cultures, as you mentioned, are an amazing example of we can be taught to be modest and taught that this actually is good and that we shouldn't brag, right? That bragging is something bad. But if your peers, for example, update their manager in their project and you don't, you very easily fall behind on perceived competence. So this is not about bragging, it's simply stating the fact. As we teach at I'm Remarkable, accomplishments do not speak for themselves. Which is totally different from the way we learn, I feel. I feel that in our culture, we have this mindset that your actions count more than what you say. Absolutely. And that's the point, right? Your actions do count, but you have to let people know what you did. I think another element of this equation, which for me at least was very impactful when I started learning from, is the role that unconscious bias play in this how people are perceived. So we also have to remember that unconscious bias tend to benefit dominant groups and discriminate against minoritized groups. Research has proven that, for example, women tend to self-promote less And when they finally do it, they tend to suffer criticism from men and sadly, other women. It's a classic thing that when a woman says something, she's bossy, while a man say the same thing and they're decisive. So as we were saying at the beginning, if we are all afraid of suffering backlashes, those unconscious bias and those learned behaviors make women be more modest. And this goes much beyond gender. Another study showed that white sounding names got 50% more callbacks than job applicants with the same qualification, but with names that sound from other ethnicities. So if you take an intersectional approach on this and analyze the multiple identities that we can have, a white man, for example, tends to be judged by their expected potential and women of color for example, or Latinx, non-binary, have to actually prove their accomplishments and be judged by their historical instead of their potential. So the playing field is really unfair. Yeah, absolutely. It's just so sad. And I can see a lot of times like minority groups, Latinx, people of color working twice as much just being heard or considered for a project and which is totally different from like a white male, as you said, they are hired by the potential. And for other folks, they need to deliver like twice as good to be considered. This is so unfair. Therefore, developing confidence and self-promotion is a much more complex issue, right, than we first look at. And I think our gut reaction, again, as Latinos and Latinas and Latinx, is like, oh, that is not... So our first reaction as Latinx sometimes can be, oh, this is bragging, this is bad. But when you see those dynamics, you can understand that you have to develop those tools not only for yourself, so you can have a better chance, but also to not perpetuate these kind of models in societies that keep making that thing feel so unfair. Absolutely. And I can imagine the amount of insights and inspiration this project brings you. How did the I Am Remarkable project change you? This journey about building confidence and getting awareness about social perceptions is very, very personal to me. I now have been working with business and technology for over 13 years. And many times I was the only, the only women, the only Latinx, the only non-native speakers and go on. But I didn't connect that at all with my lack of confidence. I thought those topics have nothing to do with each other. Like many, I personally also felt that self-promotion was a bad word. And it was just not for me. Like you mentioned, I was used to working harder and, you know, I had really no motivation to be better at this particular skill. What uh, really triggered me to care was when I stopped being the only and witnessed heartbreaking examples of other women, Latinx and non-native speakers that were very modest and suffered real consequences because of not speaking up. 
this is exactly the kind of examples that you also share. I've always cared about the quality and understanding that by not talking about my own accomplishment, I was helping to endorse an expected modesty for those people really moved me. To get those people comfortable to speak up, I also had to start doing it myself. So it became a personal goal to develop that skill. So I use I'm Remarkable to develop first my own skill of self-confidence, self-promotion. Later, I start teaching others, you know, on the importance of biases and the awareness of these topics. And now it's a pleasure to help to scale those learnings and hopefully accelerate, you know, the removal of the systemic barriers that prevent equal opportunity. That is so interesting. And I think one thing that it might be a good start to, because sometimes you're too humble, but you can do maybe some baby steps that start to acknowledge your team's work or someone who did a great job, start to acknowledge this person and it might become more natural to you to do the same thing about yourself. A hundred percent. There are so many simple things that we can do in our daily lives to create that awareness and just ensure that people feel more comfortable. As you mentioned, ensuring that you give, you know, voice for people that are usually, you know, not so proactive about you know, speaking up. When they do speak up, you can endorse their ideas, right? Making sure that they feel heard, listen, bring embrace. Other things that you can do also is challenge, you know, and attribute ideas to the right place. When someone say we, you know, you can actually say, hey, what exactly was your contribution to that? You know, these are very small things that help the environment to be more inclusive and people more inclined to develop this skill. Yeah, I like that a lot. So Juliana is also a TED Talk speaker. Her presentation team is the Visions of a Curious Mind, where Juliana shares more about her curious adventures. First, learning English and then exploring different jobs and countries. You want to share more about your experience doing the TED Talk and tips on how we can apply curiosity in our daily lives. Yes, doing a TEDx was one of the scariest things I have done. As I mentioned, I struggle a lot with confidence and self-promotion. On top of that, I think TED has a format that makes it so comparable and there are so many great names and examples. I just kept thinking about those things and got terrified and immobilized, to be honest. It was a big shame storm. When I finally was able to discuss this idea with friends, I was like, what should I share? I had no clue where to start. And it became clear to me as they helped me to understand what stood up for them was not the what, you know, the things that I've done, but the how, you know, I took that unusual path. Most often I created opportunities by literally being very curious. But my nerd self had to double check if the hypothesis of curiosity helps you to learn more and open new opportunities for you. So I did some research and there's plenty of studies that prove that initial insight and curiosity then became the anchor of my talk. Beyond then sharing a bit of my story, which I definitely struggle and today still struggling by talking to you, I try to summarize, you know, what I learned and how I try to go by in three very simple tips. The first one, and maybe the most important to me, is to be present. The word today incentivizes us to multitask to think about the future, to kind of be in this mindset of aspirational self instead of here and now. But if we are able to simply focus on one thing, it's like getting the noise down and you can actually think more clearly and honestly just get more joy of, out of a simple task. The second tip is about making more open questions. This is an important technique to let people bring their gifts to the table. We can be surprised of what people can share when you allow them, when you give them space. I think our remarkable, for example, is a great example of how we do that. And last and but not at all least is to actively listen to people. This has a lot to do with what I share about biases. If we don't pay attention that we are listening, Our biases can shut us down. You know, it's that inner voice that comes and say, 
I got this, you know, move forward. What I'm going to reply instead of listening, purely listening to what people are saying. So with these three simple steps, anyone can actually become more curious. And I can see the impact of curiosity in my life. So I would strongly recommend anyone to try either because they, you know, want to expand their possibilities, they want to change career, you know, or simply they just want to empathize more with people and be more inclusive. I love that. I love your tips. And I think it's really fascinating what you said about opportunities because a lot of times we might wait or feel frustrated because the opportunities are not coming to us because we might have this idea that, oh, they need to come to you. But a lot of times you can create our own opportunities and this can start with curiosity. As you said, first step was learning English, listening to music. And then other things started to play out. And in my case, I think with this podcast, it's something that I never thought I would do because it's so far away from my comfort zone. But it's bringing me a lot of joy and it's been an amazing opportunity. So it's really interesting. And this also reminds me of a quote. I don't know what this quote is from. I don't know the person. I might need to do some research. But the person basically said that they didn't have space so they decided to create their own and I remember when I heard that and was like that's it this is gold <laughs> absolutely absolutely I think these topics are so related right because sometimes we lack the confidence but sometimes also it's about us doing that move of simply listening to other people right you don't have to go and create this amazing podcast out of nowhere I'm sure that you had very meaningful conversations that maybe didn't start with the goal of creating a podcast, but took you there because you just let that curiosity drive you. I love this project of yours because it's exactly an example of being out of your comfortable zone. But at the same time, I'm sure that that adds to your professional life as much as to your personal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been amazing and a really good pandemic project that we will continue. We are not stopping. <laughs> we have a goal. We are interviewing folks from all Latin America countries. And I think we interviewed 15 countries. So we have a lot to go. Talking about resources, do you want to share with us which resource helped you in your journey? Yes. So I'm personally a big fan of therapy. It really helped me to become more comfortable in my own skin, have a better sense of who I am and where I stand. And I think there is a lot of stigma about seeing a therapist, but actually anyone can benefit from it at all times in life and not only when things get really tough. So I definitely recommend for your self-confidence, but just for yourself, well-being, honestly, you know, see a therapist. <laughs> I also have been very, very intentional lately on how I spend my time on social media. I think especially during this period of pandemic where we are more isolated than ever, you know, and what we see in the digital world reflects so much of what we believe is real. Selecting digital content that empowers you and reflect a more diverse set of people and, you know, and good influence in your life instead of insisting on those, you know, mainstream profiles that sometimes we don't even know why we follow. These are like simple things that actually makes me every day feel that I belong more, you know, that I'm less imperfect, you know, and make me accept myself more. So I definitely recommended those. And something else that has been helpful for me in these last few years, I think especially again with the pandemic, has been books. Growing up, I was not, you know, the one that read all the books and things like that. But it's been interesting to see the impact that they have been having in my life lately. So some books or some authors that I love lately is like Jamila Ribeiro, Brazilian author that talks so much about Black feminism. <laughs> She's amazing, right? So needed. Brennan Brown, which talks so much about shame and how the sense of belonging, you know, that we crave is important. Bell Hooks, which is so honest, you know, and the way she expressed herself. And she's just able to, you know, put words on feelings that I could never. Or even Elizabeth Huber, that I think she brings a 
light sense, you know, in life. It's an amazing story. She has an amazing story of like a bunch of struggles, but she looks at it, you know, in such a light way. All these things really inspires me. So these are some of the names that I recommend. And last but not at all, less important is do a unwrap a workshop, right? <laughs> yes, this is our surprise. So you're waiting until the end. So Jo, tell us more. So I'm so excited to share with this community the power of those workshops. We are going to be opening a slot specially for those that listen to Latinx in Power. And we hope that you can join us in one of the sessions and just experience what we talk about today. Amazing. So we are going to link in the description of this episode where you can find more and subscribe to hear more about this podcast and be part of it. And in the meantime, you can also check our social media channels so you can learn more about this workshop too. So it's going to happen on June 30th at 6 p.m. PST and you can find more information in the description of this episode and Jude, that was amazing and I want to end this podcast with a quote from your TED Talk that is so amazing which is be present make more open questions take the time to actively listen and be curious that was incredible obrigada Juliana so I want to leave the last minutes for you to share anything you want to share with us and where people can find you. Thank you so much. Obrigada, Thais. <laughs> I feel, again, having spaces like these is what actually makes a difference. Thank you again, Thais, for having me. It's great to see you again, <laughs> to share a bit the story. And actually, it's a gift to me to reflect on my own story, you know, and what I'm bringing to the table. So thank you for the opportunity for this reflection and to hold this space for the Latinx community, which so much needed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and be so open with us and also to offering this workshop that is really exciting and I know how hard it is to get an, an I am remarkable workshop so thank you for that my pleasure I would love to listen to more Latinx stories as we do this workshop so looking forward to it mm -hmm.